Um, good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to our evening presentation. My name is Flor Zephyr, and I am the chairperson of the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. And on behalf of our department and the Afro Romance Language Institute, the Peace Studies Program, and the Department of Sociology, headed by my colleague Tula Pierce, and uh, the Peace Studies Program I mentioned is headed by Dr. Clarence Lowe. I think you will join us later. I want to welcome you to our presentation. And our speaker this evening is uh, Professor Anwar Bemalek. And Professor Bemalek currently is, teach is a professor of mathematics and statistics at the University of Paris Sud. Um, Professor Bemalek uh, was born in Algeria and he studied at the University of Constantine in Algeria. And after that, he went to the Ukraine and he has a PhD in statistics and mathematics from the University of Kiev. Um, in addition to being a scientist, he is also a novelist, a journalist, and a poet. He is the, he is the recipient of many international awards for his fiction, and he has been compared to Camus and Faulkner, with some critics judging him to be the greatest Algerian writer since Kateb Yassin. Professor Bemalek is the author of, among other books, Les Amants des Unis, and the English version is The Lovers of Algeria, for which he received the prix Mimouni. He is also the author of another book, L'Enfant du Peuple Ancien. The English version is Child of an Ancient People, which received the prix Réseau France d'Outre-mer. He, he also has another book, The Rat, translated as The Adoption. And his most recent work was published last fall, and the title is Tu ne mourras plus demain. I suppose when the English translation comes out, it would be something like, You will no longer die tomorrow. He is the co-founder of the Algerian Committee Against Torture. Mr. Bemalek collected and published testimonies of nearly 200 Algerians who have been imprisoned and tortured by the army and police for participating in the anti-government demonstration of October 1998. And the title of his talk tonight is From the Birth Announcement to the Obituary, Writing as a Ticket for a Strange Journey. Indeed, it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you Algerian writer Anwar Bermalek. From my, uh, from my accent. But uh, sometimes you will uh, have the impression that I'm not speaking in English, but in uh, other language. <laughs> uh, I would like first to thank you for the opportunity you offered to a writer coming from so far away to speak about his small personal literary concerns and about some uh, social and political consideration which can surround his work when one is, as it is the case for me, a mixture of West and East, of Islamic culture and Christian culture, having lived in a country of intense religiosity and living now in secular Europe. One might think that the civil status of a writer should not play a determining role in his artistic work. It is not the case for me, 
sometimes unfortunately and sometimes fortunately. I am myself a compound of various identities, coming from a multicolored family, a mix of North, African and European. A Swiss trapeze artist grandmother, it's true. <laughs> a Mauritanian slave great grandmother, a Bavarian great grandmother, a Nigerian father and a Moroccan mother. In, 19, uh, in, 19, in 1990, I left for France at the beginning of what many of my Algerian compatriots then called the war against the civilians, when armed Islamic groups broke out against the intellectuals, the journalists, the artists, and more generally, against all those who refused to swap a military dictatorship for another dictatorship, a theocratic one, even more terrible. After a few years of living and working in France, I found it natural to ask for French nationality. Thus, of my present identity, two poles emerge. Algeria, where I grew up, to which I am linked by childhood and adolescence, love and the loyalty I owe to my father and his country, France, because French is my language of writing and thus my language of life since to live for me is first to write. I uh, would like to give you my point of view about the influence on the work of a writer of what I will call for lack of a better definition, the poison of purity. A writer born in the Arab world, and more generally in the Muslim world, drags always with him, in the eyes of many, a kind of macula, an indelible stain due to the fact that, consciously or unconsciously, he is supposed to be full to the brim of his ethnic and religious identity. It's actually authorities which are funny. <laughs> Full to the brim of his ethnic and religious identity, reified and reduced to be only, at the end, a lower version of a true, complete writer. These Arab-born writers are often dreams then to get right of this identity prison. The rich, as he believes, a timeless and a geographical universality. In the same manner that uh, folk music is opposed to classical one, to classical music, the first considered lower than the second, the writer of Algerian ori origin, as an example because of my case, is assigned a box from which he is not supposed to escape on pain of ridicule, of if not of treason. Let us start. Let us start initially by, as it is said in French, turning around the pot. I will take here the introductory sentence of a lecture I gave at the University of Cork. Here is this super sentence, but which is not for me. The man who finds his fatherland sweet is only a tender-hearted novice. He, for whom each land is, is as his own country, is stronger. But the only perfect one is he for whom the whole world is alien. It is a sentence from Hugues of Saint-Victor, who dates from the uh, 12th century, quoted in particular by Edouard Said, an American of Arab origin, himself quoted by a French writer of Bulgarian origin, Zvetan Todorov, who found it in, he, in a book of Eric Auerbach, a German exiled in Turkey, then, after many others, by me, at the end of the list. It is indeed my spontaneous reaction to any question relative to my identity. A whole part of my life as a man and writer has consisted in fighting against this essentialization, 
Algerian essentialization in my case, which tries to imprison me in a national linguistic and religious constraints. I thought, uh, pardon, I fought tooth and nail to acquire this freedom, in spite of the political obstacles and the pressures of imposed fraternity, in spite of the uniqueness of thought considered as an antidote against plurality. The later uh, viewed as a potential enemy of the cohesion of the community. Identity is often thought as ontological, reifying and, and classifying human beings in the manner of a police anthropometry. If you are Algerian, that would mean that you are essentially different from a French, a Senegalese, an American, thus denying the biological and spiritual fraternity born from the unity of our species, returning us, in spite of our common humanity, toward the animal kingdom, where any member of a whole regards as a mortal enemy any element not belonging to his group. In the worst of the cases, it leads to the following consequence. We are really ourselves only and only if we oppose the others. Who are the others? Oh, it is very easy. They are the others. No need of more simplicity than that in this kind of question. This is not only simple philosophical and linguistic acrobatics. In Algeria, for example, not so long ago, and that remains true for not a small part of the population, one was classified in the ranks of true Algerians and in the case of writers in the ranks of true Algerian writers, if one showed enthusiastic support for Islamic fundamentalists, the then expected new masters of the country and their terrorizing violence. Let us not forget too quickly that this quarrel about identity and the presumed equivalence between the identity of the Algerians and the majority religion which can seem here Byzantine, to say the least, cost the life of more than 150,000 people in Algeria, not counting the numerous wounded and displaced persons. I know, of course, what my legal identities are. The answer is simple, because it is attested by administrative uh, documents. I do not know, on the other hand, which is, or rather, which are my true identities, those of my heart or my soul. I, who come from such varied horizons, as I said it to you in introduction, with an Algerian nationalist father, a man who passionately loved theater and who fought for the independence of his country, a Moroccan mother, doubly oppressed by the racist society of the then French protectorate and by the archaic status of women in Islam. A Swiss grandmother, trapeze artist in a circus, who herself was regarded as a second-class citizen in her own society. An African great-grandmother who was a black slave, rejected by the anti-black racism still so vivid in the Arab Berber societies. All that in a linguistic path where the languages overlapped in spite of their mutual contact. When the winds of intolerance blow, this identity diversity is obviously perceived as an handicap and a macular difficult to accept. You thus see the dilemma of a writer like me. At one side, to refuse to dissolve himself in a community which, because he wants, uh, because it wants to embrace him so exclusively, risk, risks shocking him to death, at least intellectually. And to remember on the other side that he is indelibly from a place and from a culture 
and that there is no use in denying it. If I want to reach universality, perhaps it is better, it is better to follow the French piece of advice to make against misfortune good herb, or the American to make the best of a bad deal, and to transform the curse to be Arab into a literary asset. In fact, while being uh, a little cynical, what an interesting place for a creator of stories, in other words, an experimenter of life, than this living in the Arab world. The dictatorships and the intolerant societies oblige you to answer in a radical way to the injection of real care. Either the fear may makes you give up wisely the art of writing, or you try to follow, whether you like it or not, the uh, premonitory advice of an Algerian writer Tahar Jawood, who paid the price of his freedom with two bullets in the head. Silence is death. And you, if you remain silent, you die. And if you speak, you die. So speak and die. <laughs> As a practical illustration, I would like to tell you briefly uh, the destiny of two of my books. The first, Omaria, is devoted to the tragedy of the Moriscos of Spain. The second, Abduction, tries to find a connection, even partial, between the current violence of Algeria and the sometimes unbounded violence of its war of independence. With these two examples, I would wish to show you how much being a, a simple teller of stories could be delicate in Muslim art countries. Let us start with Omaria. The Moriscos are these descendants of the Muslim Andalusians obliged to convert after the defeat of 1492, that we know and the penalty of being burned and deported by hundreds of thousands to Africa at the beginning of the 17th century after a royal edict of banishment 100 years after the fall of Granada. In the heart of any inhabitants of this vast area, which one call, calls too quickly the Arab world, the topic of Andalusia occupies a specific place. Almost consolatory. This luminous period, often ideally fantasized sometimes, of the history of the Iberian Peninsula, recalls to the citizens of these nations, which go from the Red Sea to the Atlantic, that they are not condemned to undergo eternally the status of unworthiness and humiliation which is currently theirs. By reading, by reading again and again the pages of history of these eight centuries of Muslim presence in Spain, these men and these women, oppressed everywhere, inside and outside their multiple fatherlands, realize, realize that their predecessors have been able, following the example of citizens of other great civilizations, to bring in the past and with what talent their contribution to the progress of arts and science. For example, the Arab Icarus, Ibn Firas, was the first, for example, to experiment a flying machine near Cordoba. I just knew as a writer that at one time or another of my life I was going to tackle this subject. It is true that in the way I would decide to focus on the period which followed the fall of Grenada, and consequently the final failure of this magical Andalusia, perhaps because the failure is a more interesting literary material, I will confess with some cynicism. 
Besides, I have the good luck to find an extraordinary report from the questioning of Spanish war, half uh, Muslim and half Catholic, who was tortured by the Holy Inquisition, refusing to betray her husband. This woman preferred to cut her own tongue with her teeth and to be sentenced to be burned at the stake. Who is able to do that? From this unbelievable demonstration of love, I endeavored uh, to write a novel of passion, of course, full of violence, mocking sometimes the monotheist intolerances and the absolute certitudes of all the protagonists of these times. Much to my surprise, I discovered after the publication of, the, of this novel in Paris the great topicality of these Middle Ages wars of religion. My book was perceived by a part of the press of the Arab world uh, of, uh, as what it was not. A frenzied attack against the civilization of Islam and this in spite of the fact that it shed light on the destiny of the last Andal Andalusian Muslims and did, it quite with, uh, and did it with sympathy and compassion, even if the writer, writer's empathy neither prohibited lucidity nor, on some occasion, irony. Many people in Algeria, uh, France, and elsewhere that reviewed Omaria were, how to say that, characterized by an extra kindness. But for other journalists in the Arab world, who confuse literature and theology, literate, the literary criticism and the call to lynching without euphemism, life and truth in a novel written by an Arab writer on the Muslim world could only be by definition blasphemous, especially if in an aggravating circumstance this prose is written in the language, language of the former colonizer. Freedom to think for this uh, service, uh, freedom to think for these servile flatterers of the guardians of the temple, mosques here, can only be applied. Judging Omaria sacrilegious, all the employees of the Algerian publishing house with which the contract for a local edition had been signed, threatened to resign as a whole, as a whole if the management persisted in publishing my novel. By the means of an informer, the rumor flew from there to the most important Arabic language newspaper of Algeria. I knew then what uh, seems to be accurately the dream, the second dream of any writer. A big article on the first page of the daily newspaper with the larger circulation, except that in the context of religious uh, terrorism blooding the country, it was instead a nightmare. The article reproached me in venomous terms for attacking the religion of a billion people and comparing me with Salman Rushdie and with the Pope Benoit XVI, concluded, uh, concluded his uh, death trial by claiming that I have to pay the consequences of my blasphemous book. On the evening of the same day, uh, two important satellite ch channels of the Middle East sharply criticized the book and its author with the, the usual tone uh, of this kind of denunciation in the Muslim world. In the Muslim world. By the miracle of internet and its copy past facilities, the content of these attacks was reproduced the following day with an identical virulence in the majority of the written press of the region, from Iraq, in war, to Saudi Arabia, passing from Lebanon to Yemen and elsewhere. <coughs> to these were added a multitude of blogs and Islamic websites, all equally furious. On the website of a satellite channel, a net surfer proclaimed, after half a thousand 
of uh, after half thousand heinous messages of the same time, if I had been president, I would have burned this ready. Notice that the first chapter of my novel opens precisely on a public execution by far ordered by the Spanish ex uh, Inquisition. I was in France when the French police wanted me less than 24 hours after the publication of the Algerian newspaper that a, a terrorist group called uh, for my physical elimination. Which hero will clear us from this enemy of our great nation? Pompously uh, questioned the official statement of the terrorists while demanding it, it was not a literary image to cut off my head. And no more need for leaflets and militants to spread this call for killing. Mr. Google undertakes uh, this text better than the best postman of the world, since it is enough even now to type my name in Arabic on the search engine and to find on the first page the exhortation of this terrorist group. I must acknowledge that I did not feel well at the reading of this bombastic but explicitly murderous prose. I had done some more reporting in Lebanon, but uh, the, f the fear, real, which I had felt under the Israeli bombardment at the time of the invasion of Beirut, or later when the so-called war camps would oppose the Shiites and the Palestinians, this fear concerned only my person. But as a father and a husband, I was not alone anymore. I do not dare to describe uh, the anguish which invaded me by imagining the worst. I, who seldom smoked, started to smoke cigarettes after cigarettes. I was not unaware that the terrorists of the uh, armed Islamic group and their allies in, in Europe cynically justified the massacre of children at this time of widespread, widespread attacks and holocaust of villages by telling that it was doing them a favor, and I'm speaking seriously here, that it was doing them a favor, their innocence opening for them the doors of paradise. Following the recommendation of the French security services, we left the family home. I will not enter into the details. It is enough to say that one finds oneself quite alone in such a situation, halfway between underground and the, the normal life, since it is necessary to continue to walk and to bring the children to school. With only one and all the more invaluable exception, I did not receive the least public support from my Algerian or French colleagues. One of them, an Arab writer politically classified as on the left, and whom I believed to be a friend, even allowed himself to apostrophize me in this way at an expected meeting in Algiers several months later while still alive. A detail makes me smile even now. We explained it to my son nine years old at the time, that we were obliged to quit our house because of big problems with the plumbing. He was very excited and delighted with this miraculous possibility to skip classes. He even made a commentary which made us give a hollow laugh. I hope that the repaying will last a long time. I admit that I have been deeply hit by uh, 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 the Omar scandal and the hatred it aroused. With my book, I thought I had paid tribute to the memory of the Moriscos, those victims of the criminal fanaticism of the uh, Reconquista. And I found, and I found again, the dirty face of this intolerance five centuries ago, uh, later, in my fellow citizens of the south of the Mediterranean Sea. 
disguise it differently, of course, making use of modern tools to split its hatred of free uh, doubt, but unchanged as to the content, always tempted, tempted to reduce to silence its contradictors by terror and death. I took it badly, more especially when some of my friends didn't hesitate to blame me for having endangered my family by writing such a book as an act of pure selfishness. Their arguments agreed with the reproach often thrown away like spit on the face of the rapid woman. Of course, they are wrong, but recognize that it is partly your fault. You provoked them. Somebody even, even suggested to me, without shame, that I should write a new novel, where I would explain my regrets for having written Omaria, putting my uh, error on the account of monetary blindness. And then, after months, months of distress and confusion, during which I swore to never write again a word about this so harsh Arab world, I broke my vain promise and undertook the writing of another note, Abduction, where I tried to describe the extreme violence of the National Liberation Front during some episode of the Algerian War of Independence through a tragic example, the massacre of Medusa from the name of a village in the Algerian mountains, all the male population of fish had been killed by the Ephelian combatants. In my novel, I wanted to explain part of the violence of the Islamic groups of the 90s and uh, 200s by the residual effect of this violence of the war of independence. Let us first clear an ambiguity which would be otherwise an ignominy. My idea was not to link <coughs> mechanically to a priori so antagonistic historical events. The war of independence aimed at freeing Algeria from colonial oppression. The war of the terrorists is in line with exactly the opposite ideology. And its declared goal is to control the country, its institutions, its culture, and its inhabitants with an obscurantist vision of the world regarding democracy as a perverse Intervention, uh, invention, and not hesitating to assassinate those who dare to question uh, the medieval principle of Islamic theocracy. This being said, we are forced to recognize that if the aim of the war of liberation couldn't be nobler, the means used by the FLN to impose itself as the single representative of the Algerian people in their fight against colonial domination were sometimes of an extreme brutality. Using torture and assassination of Algerians, often as patriotic as the most engaged of the combatants of the FLN. In certain cases, like that of Medusa, this violence can be classified without hesitation as a war crime. War crime. To say it with force is not to betray the ideals of freedom for which the Algerian guerrilla fighters fought, but quite the reverse. In this sense, there is for me a, rel a relationship between certain behaviors of the FLN, of the war of liberation, and the cruelty of the Islamic terrorist group in contemporary uh, Algeria. In fact, the Algerian terrorists said to themselves that if the FLN could perpetrate on behalf of the liberation of the country a mass massacre such, such as that of Medusa without much damage to its image and uh, to its image, why would Bentelha, Raiz or Ramka Uh, not be forgiven uh, to, to them 
since they uh, act on behalf of an ideal even more sacred. Uh, uh, Bertaha, Rais, and Ramka are Algerian villages massacred by the Islamic uh, 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 terrorists and which should be known throughout the world as Gernika or Oran. Societies such as those of Algeria have, are captive of lies. Lies of the past, lies of the present, which need the second helping the first, lies of the future. There is nothing new in what I am saying here, but the setup for me is to discover, to re rediscover, that this contempt for the basic rights of the human being by the Arab states is accompanied by a kind of resigned consent of the population. In the Arab countries, this frame of mind to scorn one's own rights of citizenship is related to a Middle Ages conception more or less rooted in the social subconscious, who succeeds in gaining control of the state gains the power with the magic meaning of this term, that is, the absolute latitude to do what he wants so long as he is at the head of the state. According to this representation of the force, as to the determining and almost only source of legitimacy, that who controls the means of coercion and therefore the means of redistribution of the national wealth to the profit of one's vassals has the right, since, he is, since it is he who di dictates in the literal sense of the term, the law, to enjoy power until that power is lost by violence generally needless to say. The sentence for me, I repeat, and the more appalling is not this predation of the national wealth by the various forms of dictators oppressing the societies of the Arab world. It is not the greed of the hybrid political men surrounding these di dictators, even when they belong officially to the opposition, with nevertheless rare, courageous, and perilous exceptions. For me, the most terrible is the observation that in the Arab world, the Arab world, the aspiration to a democratic life is not yet a natural reflex, even if one can strongly moderate this judgment after the experiments, still very far from being conclusive of Libya, Egypt, and Yemen. The struggle for human rights and the respect in particular of the physical integrity of the citizen is still regarded by a good part of the population as a luxury reserved for countries seen as rich. Sometimes even this struggle is interpreted as an attempt to render Arab society depraved when one insists, for example, on the fact that these famous human rights relate to all human beings and therefore to women. The Arab world still dreams of an allusion, allusion to allusion, golden age, <laughs> which did not ever exist, of, uh, which did not ever exist, of course, where Arabs, or those considered as such, were all brothers, from the caliph to the most ordinary subject. This historical fable legitimates centuries of subjugation which left traces deeply rooted in the collective and conscious of the people of this area. This refusal of the simple reality of everyday life was strengthened by the fact that the holder of the political and military powers, power always proclaimed himself simultaneously the holder of religious legitimacy. Political dissidence could then be considered as an heretical dissidence, causing all the more easily dissociation 
if not even animosity, sometimes fatal, from these ordinary citizens whom the real opponents are the first to try to help in their quest for more freedom and less humiliation. To be considered as animized by their fellow citizens is a painful situation that is hard to come to terms with. For these human rights militants, nevertheless determined to advocate the case of democracy, which is for them the rule of the majority with the respect of the fundamental political and spiritual rights of the minority. What must not be mistaken here? It is because we have a high idea of the Arab world, it is because we like the Arab world, that we claim that its citizens have to require and to implement for themselves the same moral and political standards they uh, demand from the democratic countries. It is because we think that there is only one mankind, only one human species, Homo sapiens, that we refuse the political relativism which would condemn certain people of our earth to eternal civic immaturity for the greatest joy of those which make benefit from this situation. No, the Arab world should not be condemned to this existence filled with abjection. But this struggle is all the most exhausting. In the case of a country like Algeria, this involuntary uh, complicity of the oppressors with, the, uh, with their oppressors uh, can even result in a disastrous interpretation of the progress of history. Wounded by the terrible events of these last years, a certain number of wounded by the terrible <laughs> You can also, uh, <laughs> wounded by the terrible events of those last year, a certain number of Algerians came, for example, uh, to uh, think that the abominable tragedy of their country is due mainly to the introduction of democracy. We had this violence, they say, which devastated Algeria because of free election. Better uh, a non-democratic government as that who ruled us before. Uh, there were, well, uh, from time to time, arbitrary and imprisonments and torture, of course, but it was the price paid for global peace. Moreover, you were ensured not to have troubles if you did not uh, deal with politics. The then, when you speak about human rights, to ordinary uh, citizens, some of them are not far from considering you, if not like an agent provocateur, at least as one of the culprits of the bloody upheavals who brought death and destruction to so many families in Algeria. This is obviously false and terribly unjust. It amounts to accusing the victims of being guilty at least partially, of its ordeal. I think in particular about the intellectuals and the journalists in Algeria who paid the ultimate price for this simple but public demand for a little more honesty and justice in the running of their society. <laughs> so far, I have tried to explain why willingly our Unwillingly, a writer like me remains a prisoner of his origin. This duty imposed by the fact of being from an Arab country, this writer would like so much not to have to undergo it. But I have the misfortune to consider that literature is one of the most beautiful conquests of the human spirit. In our countries, the literary writings, which do not bother anybody, are not worth even the paper on which they are printed. 
there is little difference or in all between writer and vain writer. It sounds better in French, écrivain and écrivain. <laughs> I do not seek for all that, believe me, the polemic for the simple pleasure of polemic. The topics I deal with in my books matter in me for a long time until I decide to begin to write. Family history, contemporary Algeria, Middle East, Andalusia, the upheavals and turmoil of the Muslim world, the war of Algeria, and now, for my present work, the Second World War in Europe and its two absolute horrors, the Shoah and the Semidaripan. The Semidaripan is the uh, genocide of Tutsi. But I never forget, however, that if the winds of fate made me born in North Africa, I am first and after all a human being at the same time singular and similar to billions of other human beings, sharing the same strange destiny to be born, to die, and between these two radical events to try to travel, that is to live. How then, can, how then can 